and this is The End Show. And I'm your host, Gus Summers. It's good to be back with you today. That's right. We are broadcasting live from the Sunset Strip, from the In Show Studios right here in the entertainment capital of the world, Hollywood. And we have a great in-studio guest, Mr. Shane Black. Shane. Hi, Gus. Oh, how are you? Thanks for coming in. Oh, thank you for, for inviting me in. This is great. Oh, my pleasure. You know, I was reflecting on, you know, the... A little bit of the journey that we had. I remember we met a couple of years ago, right before the Iron Man uh, started, and then events since then. And it's kind of interesting how the industry is so large, but yet so small. Yeah, yeah, small, <coughs> desperately incestuous. This 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 sort of business where um, you know you'll you'll just see the same. The, the same people, some happy, some sad. Uh, the uh, happy ones sometimes get sad. The sad ones tend to stay that way. But it's it's funny. I go to parties from time to time and uh, in events, and and there's really a lot of wonderful people in the entertainment industry. That's that's what's surprising. You know, you hear yeah. it, it's painted. I think particularly in this day and age by the conservatives as that crazy, you know, debauched Hollywood yeah. crowd. But <laughs> there's actually very a, a lot of wonderful creative people I run into again and again who give me terrific inspiration and uh, I remember when we were in Austin yeah um, sitting up one night in the lounge and Terry Rossio who wrote Pirates of the Caribbean and a couple of others just stopped by and he was in a grumpy mood and I said what's wrong we started talking about movies now here comes uh, someone else who uh, John Turman who worked on The Incredible Hulk wrote that and we start, and then all the students who were there for the convention start to. Get, so it's three in the morning, and everyone's yeah. arguing about movies in the lobby until <laughs> till daybreak. You know, that's uh, the kind of thing I love. Yeah, you know, it's it's. I mean, it's, you know, your journey, and it, because you know, I've been thinking about your journey, and how you know you've been in the industry, uh, for quite a while, and you're at still the top of your game. I, I remember. I shouldn't say a long time ago, but I had a friend who wanted to become a scriptwriter the 20 years ago the example he used Shane Black and I, and I remember that and like I said as, as we met oh and uh, a little side story um, when my wife and I went on our honeymoon uh, we had a, uh, a honeymoon movie and that happened to be <laughs> the last action hero <laughs> oh my okay <laughs> so that's that's been a uh, a uh, little honeymoon movie of ours that we'll, <laughs> that we'll watch. Uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Yeah, and it says says something about <laughs> your uh, your marriage, but <laughs> I don't know, man. Um, that's an okay movie. It's not my favorite of what I've done because yeah. it suffered through so many rewrites. But right. at the same time, I think the point you make that uh, so much time has gone by, yes. and it occurs to me again and again how absolutely blessed and lucky I am to still be in the game yes. practicing yes to still be uh somehow you know forging a path after having walked this 30-year journey already yes i'm 52 years old i started as 22 and you know what i'm 52 and someday i'm gonna be a rock star i mean it's that kind of <laughs> feeling like I, i'm just starting man yes i'm with you i'm with you you know it's as i had mentioned you know I, I, television movies it was just always something that drew me to them and i would and I would tell people, a lot of the movies that you'll you'll see on DVD and Netflix, what have you, I actually saw in theaters. Yes. And you know, there's a joy in that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I remember watching Rich Man Poor Man mm -hmm. on television. You know, yeah. being sure I was there. You know, every it was once a week. Yeah. Sure good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, going to the local theater and, and seeing. I remember watching The Thing with Kurt Russell. Uh, you know, right. these, you know these. You know, and I just love these movies. I wanted to find out from you because I know you have the same love for movies. Yeah. Were there certain television shows, certain movies that made an Fluence. impact? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny because when I was a kid, there was no media about movies. It was right. it wasn't about box office. Movies were if it was in the theater, it must be good because they they put it there, <laughs> right. so you went to see it. You know, and <clears throat> and I would see crappy movies for ninety nine cents <laughs> after they left. The yes. <laughs> and you didn't wait for TV because they, right. they didn't have HBO when I was a kid. Right. It started in 1973, I think, something right. like that. So basically, I would have to try desperately to convince my parents to let me see the uh, 
the R-rated films. Right. And the first, uh, the first three R-rated films I saw, oddly enough, and I hate to think it's because they were R, right. were, it turns out, the biggest influence on me. The first one was <coughs> Three Days of the Condor. Nice. Which, by the way, uh, people, I, I tend to set a lot of things at Christmas in the films that I work on, and I, <laughs> it's partly because that was the first film set at Christmas that seemed to show how it could suffuse and sort of uh, flavor the movie. I just loved it. Right. The other one was Farewell, My Lovely, which is a classic detective piece wow. with Robert Mitchum as Philip Marlowe. Oh, I love Mitchum, yeah. And the third R-rated movie I saw was my favorite movie, still is my favorite, and that's The Exorcist. Wow. Uh, which is a timeless piece. I think yeah, it right. doesn't age a day. Right. And it just clearly shows what film is capable of yes. eliciting in an audience. Yes. So those those three were of tremendous impact to me. Wow. Wow. You know, it's, it's funny because you know, I was reflecting, you know, the movies that I enjoyed. I remember 76 and uh, a group of us, you know, went to go, to go see a show and I didn't want to see that particular movie. What did I go in? The, uh, what did I end up seeing? Rocky. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. forever <coughs> since that moment, since I saw it, it never left my mind that scene with you know Stallone and um, uh, Carl Weathers at the end when Bridges Meredith is saying, "Stay down, yeah, stay down." Yeah. What's keeping him up? That never left my mind. No. And you know times where you you know you feel I feel worn, I'll remember that. You know what keeps him up? There's just something. Right. I I agree. And in even little moments in Rocky, which taught me a lot about writing, which. The one that sticks in my head tremendously in the first Rocky is in the middle, there's that young girl who he tries to be a cool guy and say, yeah. hey, maybe you don't want to hang around with those, those people. And she just basically lays into him. And you can see him being hurt and like uh, laughing it off like it's no big deal, but you see it's hurting him. Yeah. And that the idea that, that you could show vulnerability like that right and the character is trying see that's a basic principle is that the character is presenting one face but the subtext is that they're desperately experiencing something quite different right and uh, that scene was just so powerful the whole movie is great oh um, yeah you know they and then rocky three a tremendous a completely different kind right. of movie but heralded the a new kind of filmmaking in a way yes Yes. Which was not as realistic as Rocky. It was more fairy tale, but yes. every bit as influential. Um, in the same way that you had First Blood, which was a sort of gritty thriller, and then Rambo is like a fairy tale. You know? Right. <laughs> There's no ambivalence in Rambo. He's not this crazy guy who might be a hero. He's just plain flat out hero. You're so right because I remember again First Blood, the end when he's talking to Richard Crenna, and he goes, "You know, I I, I operated a you know million dollar machinery, and I can't even hold down a job as the yeah. car wash, and it's." these bits of truth yeah it's, it's trying to be about something yeah it's amazing it's you know you, you think about you know certain actors that made that jump he did he went from this realistic up to uh, you know that superstar place so i remember i was telling um, someone uh, about kevin Connolly. Mm -hmm. that's the first time i saw kevin Connolly was paradise alley with right. stallone and uh armana sante uh, you know armana sante is another great actor yeah he is have you uh, you know, th talking about actors, uh, have there been, when, you know, when you were, um, as you were growing, were there certain actors that you just gravitated to, you know, like uh, <coughs> Mitchum or uh, um, Gene Hackman? Those certain guys. actors just really struck me, and I don't know why. Usually there were people I hadn't seen before. Okay. For instance, um, when I saw, tragically, an actor who didn't do a lot as an actor before he died was Jason Miller, the star of The Exorcist, and I just thought, yeah. what's well, something about that guy? Yeah. Similarly, William Hurt, back when he still oh, yeah. had hair, he was just <laughs> starting, you know, Altered States, oh. Body Heat, Eyewitness. Oh, yeah. I was drawn to something in the way he performed, yeah. uh, the way he could detail, the way he could nuance things. Yeah. And it occurred to me that he was practicing a craft. He wasn't just standing there saying lines like on television. This guy was operating at a level of professionalism. He was doing something I, no one else can do. Right. Um, so when I see something like that, and it, it struck me that the kind of actor that impresses me is this. It's sometimes if you want an actor for a role, you, you say, okay, well, we could get this guy, and you know what he does. You've seen it before, so yeah, pay him the five million, whatever. And right. you get him, and guess what? He does that performance, the one right. you knew you'd get, the one, you know, kind of that you wanted. Right. Then there's other actors, you pay them the money, and they you don't know what they're going to do. Yeah. 
you just know it's going to be great. Right. They surprise. They elevate the material. They surprise you. You have no idea what they're going to make of this, but you just. You go, I can't wait to find out. That's the feeling. Wow. What are they going to make of this? Right. Because they have this skill. It's like Johnny Depp when he played uh, Jack Sparrow. Right. There was. They were aghast at first. You can't <laughs> play this like some stumbling. You know. London Queen fop drunk. You know, you can't do that. And he said, yeah, that's how I want to do it. And it became so popular that he's a character at Disneyland stumbling around drunk, you know. Right, right. It, it, <laughs> you, I mean, you, you, you're you absolutely right. I mean, there are actors that just draw you. I and mean, for me, I always looked at character actors. Because mm-hmm. there's some brilliant... Uh, F. Murray Abraham. Oh, oh yeah. gee. I mean, the things he does, and you <clears throat> never know what he's going to pull... Uh, look from. at his face in in Amadeus when he's being humiliated by Mozart when right. he reads that symphony he looks at that symphony and the look on his face is just how do you do that that's it's impossible what he does actors actresses you know another one was uh, like a John Savage mm-hmm. you know they, they just for me, yeah, I think the, there is freedom within the character actor to yeah. be able to really expand and you know perform you know yeah, from some, the heart. Something else. popped in 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 his eyes. Yeah, and you usually can tell, I think, from the eyes. Right. When you're casting, you know, some people have dead sort of eyes or pretty boy <laughs> eyes or whatever you. <laughs> and then there's a character that you look and you go, oh, oh boy, yeah. something's going on there. Yeah. And John Savage was one of those, you know, John Heard. You know, oh, pre Sharknado, oh. mind you. Yes, but back in the <laughs> back in the day, you know, like even in Cat People, uh, there's yeah. just something going on. Right, I, amazing. <clears throat> I remember him in a Deception. Yeah, you know, the, um, another actor. Well, he was. By the time I I knew who he was, he was he had already um, been in the industry. Albert Finney was another one for me. Yeah, but I saw him, you know, um, in his later years. It was just. Again, I think he was going into the character <coughs> roles by the age. He was, uh, and I think also he got sober, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> you know, right? Um, and I, I'm guessing. I think that's what happened because that's uh, I wasn't there. I haven't spoken to the man, but he seemed right. to just really catch fire in uh, things like Aaron Brockovich. You know? Yes. Wow. Right. Right. <coughs> there was there was a movie I'm trying to remember. Full Moon something. Full Moon Junction. I forgot what it was. Na- it was the name. Not Two Moon Junction. The Softcore porn with Sherilyn Fenn. Yeah, no, not that. <laughs> no, not that one. It was uh, with Albert Finney. It's something full moon something. But I just remember his performance. And it was just like, you know, I thought it was amazing. Yeah, actors who practice their craft. Because no matter how big a star someone is, yeah, there's a moment. You know, they come in and maybe they have their entourage. Maybe they're picking out their trailer or whatever. But at some point, there's a room where you sit down and they roll up their sleeves and they have to look at the script and you see them doing the same thing they did in a garage when they were 16 practicing to be an actor. <laughs> they have to at some point roll up their sleeves and just do what they do. Right. And it goes beyond the entourage. It goes yes. beyond you know, the hype. It's an actor just practicing their craft. Right. And it, it's one of my favorite movies. And I think his performance is just... The whole movie just was great. All that jazz. Yeah, that's my uh, number two favorite movie, number by the way. Really? Yeah. It, and it, then Jaws after that. No, really? Yeah. <laughs> it, bo- both roll Scheider. And, and, you know, for me, you know, that, you know, if I could have an, a death sequence the way he did at the end of that movie, mm. you know. <laughs> Where he goes through the five stages of, of, of grief. grief. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's Well, that's, that's also a stunning scene where... Here's this guy who's slept with more women in his time than anybody. Right. And as he's going through these states, he wanders into the room of this old woman who's in pain. Yeah. And he's groaning in her sleep. Right. She's dying. Yeah. And he sort of leans over and seduces her and kisses her, and then she smiles and becomes for a moment. There's like a sexual look on her face, and she feels better. Yes. And oh, my <laughs> God, what a great scene that is. <laughs> Who would have thought to put that in? You know? Right, right. It, you know, you can read so much into it. You know, is that if, you know, he knows his moment's coming, and in that last moment, some sort of redemption. He's trying to yeah. give something to someone else, and he gives it the only way he knows how. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, and his performance. Who knew he could sing? Yeah. Well, he was probably yeah. not the best singer in that movie. But you know, it's it's to go from the Seven Ups, yeah, <laughs> to all that jazz. Well, I mean, what a range! Because he's always been the you know the, the stoic, the you know. No, the and he's another one. When you saw him in Jaws, yeah, 
yeah, there was just something there. You'd, you'd never seen them before, really. I mean, people had seen the 7-Ups, but right. when people saw Jaws, they were kind of experiencing Roy Scheider for the first time. Yeah. And once again, it's that wonderful feeling of a movie where the movie's the star, right. and you populate it with people who are not necessarily uh, superstars in their own right. Right. And it just takes off. Um, isn't that, in a way, I'm, I'm sort of, of guessing, but isn't that what happened with Spielberg, who made wonderful movies using non-stars. Yes. And when he finally made a movie with Robin Williams, Dustin Hoffman, it, he was kind of floundering. Right. He was used to actors who he could just say, do this, do that, and let's all get together. And He wasn't used to dealing with the personalities right. and, and, and addressing, you know, the issues of familiarity, that people come to the movie with a baggage of expectation. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and, absolutely. You, know, you didn't expect anything from Roy Scheider and Jaws. You just wanted to get to know him. Yes. I have to ask you real quick. So what's the, the number one Shane Black pick in movies? Um, <clears throat> you know, currently it, it, it's tough. I would say my top five going back, it's Exorcist, Jaws, all that jazz, Kramer versus Kramer, nice. oddly. Oh, wow. wow. Um, and uh, little movies, which are just... The little ones that I've just loved recently, not too recently, uh, Pieces of April. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, Blue Valentine. And, uh, you know, and of course I love, you know, the big adventure films, the, the good ones, the old school ones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, there's just, I, I hearken back to a time when you used to be able to stand in line on a summer's day for two hours to see a movie. Yeah. And you said, Dad, that was worth it. Right. I'm glad I did that. Yeah. You know, who wants to stand in line for three hours now to see the latest Twilight sequel? I don't. <laughs> you, you know, I, I think you, you you're, you're touching on something. Uh, do you think they're more drawn to the actors versus the story? You know, because you would see, you would hear a small movie, yeah, and it'll capture you. That's that's interesting because I remember uh, a movie that caught my attention and. There were unknown actors back then. The Warriors. Mm -hmm. Michael Beck, James Remar was in this. David you know. Patrick Kelly. <laughs> Patrick Kelly. You know, they were basically unknowns. Yeah. But there was just something about the movie. <coughs> Do you think we kind of miss that today? I think we still have it at the lower budget range. Unfortunately, it, it's, it's like America has seen a, a polarization of wealth between the poor and, and the upper class, the middle class shrinking, so, so too in movies. Right. You know, it seems like something costs 1.5 million or 150 million, and there's no between. Right. Um, more and more, there's there's foreign financing, there's foreign movies, but the ones every year that cost about 30 or 40, yeah, and have a star that's not, you know, uh, Johnny Depp or Tom Cruise, but a star, you know like say Ryan Gosling those movies yeah. don't seem to be happening as much okay. um, everyone wants a tent pole yes and I can understand that because the you know in Vegas the quick and easy way to get a lot of money is to bet a lot of money right and if these people think they have they can hedge the odds with sequels and things so now the house doesn't have it they have the ability to put in 200 and get back 800 right who wouldn't do that yeah the problem is fewer movies get made mm -hmm. and the pressure to concentrate on four quadrant films that appeal to as many people as possible takes away the ability in those bigger movies to really incorporate risk right take chances do something amazing they're more you know there's a lot more attention let's just say on the audience cards and on reading them and say well so and so had a problem in you know Act three, you put the glass on the wrong table. We better change that. They're always looking for the feedback of how can we appeal four quadrant to as many folks out there to make sure our two hundred million dollars investment yeah. is recouped. Right. Whereas if you did a smaller movie, you might be more encouraged to, you know, uh, you know, David O. Russell when he did The Fighter. How the hell did that get made? <laughs> it's right. it's a small movie. Yes. But. <clears throat> not that small right and it takes a lot of chances yeah you know it's funny to me because uh, what I see now and it, it, as if my opinion matters but 
where I go now is not necessarily to the movies. Right. Because what has taken the place of those mid-range kind of riskier $40 million movies yeah. is the limited 12-episode uh, premium cable series. Oh, yes. Like, you know, Game of Thrones, House of Cards, uh, even Justified or uh, Homeland. I mean, these shows, Walking Dead, it's like they thrive on risk. Yes. You don't know if a character you've, you've met for eight episodes is going to suddenly be blown to pieces in episode nine. Right. You're right. You know, they just, they love taking chances and yes. shifting things up. So I spend a lot of time these days uh, going on, you know, Netflix or Vudu and just looking at <laughs> these kinds of shows. Right. Where they have time, 12 episodes to just lay it out, 12 hours of stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I adore it. You know, that's yeah, because I, I know we were talking, I'm going to have mentioned about Rich Man, Poor Man. Mm -hmm. Because that's what exactly what they did. You know, each each week, you know, it was Peter Strauss, Nick Nolte, William Smith. You know, these, oh, what happened here? Oh, what's going to happen there? And then you don't know how each one's going to affect everybody else. So, you know, I think it's the, the same model that you're, you're talking about. Yeah. You know, who, who knows what's going to happen next that yeah. you can't get. Uh, and, and, and just... <coughs> And not padding it. I love it when there's, they take the time for 12 episodes to do the story, but they don't say, we got 12 hours, let's just put every scene in there. <laughs> right. Um, remember there's, there was a Stephen King miniseries called uh, Storm of the Century. Yeah. And they had like three consecutive nights, like two hours each. So it was like a six-hour miniseries. And they, I swear to you, they had two, uh, two hours of story. <laughs> and they said, well, we filmed all this. Let's just not edit it. Let's just show it all. Right. And so you got the six-hour version of a two-hour story because they filled the nights, but they padded it. And that's, yeah. I hate the idea of padding yes. something, stretching it. Yeah. Stuff it. That's what you should do. Right, right. Get it in as much as possible and let them do it within that moment. Right. You should yeah. be cramming these things. Oh, that's fantastic. Fantastic. Shane, again, you know, thank you for coming in. I'm going to take a quick commercial break. We still got another segment. So love um, love to talk more about uh, books this time. I know we have an sure. affinity for books. All right. Appreciate it. Hey, well, this is Gus Summers, and you've been listening to The In Show. And we have in-studio guest Mr. Shane Black, and we're going to have more of him in our next segment. So you hang in there. We'll be right back. And this is The In Show. And I'm your host, Gus Summers. Good to be back with you today. That's right. We have another great in-studio guest, Mr. Shane Black. We were talking about um, uh, Brett uh, Halliday. Brett Halliday, yeah. And it, it's one of your uh, favorite, he's one of your favorite authors. Yeah, when I was a kid, I would go to the local library. Um, you know, uh, there was actually some, a great old Gothic building, which was later condemned, which was a library where you prowl these rooms, the creaky floorboards, and um, and I would find these Mike Shane mysteries by Brett Halliday. And yes. as a kid, I read them. And then as an adult, I went back, got them all in paperback. There's like 29 that he actually wrote. Um, and I found that they were so engaging and so fun plot-wise. It was back when the, you know, getting a mystery that really engaged and puzzled the, the reader was important. And so he actually took one of them called Bodies Are Where You Find Them <coughs> and plucked some elements from it. I actually optioned the book and I, I used bits of it in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang pl for the plot. And I just... That's to me old detective fiction, new detective fiction. That's that's where it's at. I mean, I have I don't know what it is about the detective genre that just really appeals to me. I've never been as much a sci-fi fan. Yeah. Because sci-fi to me bled over. If you go to the sci-fi rack yeah. in the store, even as long or as recently as like you know a couple years ago, as long ago as twenty, it's all elves. <laughs> it used to be Arthur C. Clarke, you know, hard science. You know? Yeah, right, right. Suddenly it's elves and swords and, you know. Fantasy yeah. type stuff, yeah. And so I steered away. I, I wasn't as interested in the elves. And I just wanted to see that lonely sort of bizarre observer detective walking the mean streets, seeing yeah. people act out their desperate, petty little, you know, endeavors and obsessions. and and uh, But then even, even going back, Mike Shane, you'll notice, this is interesting, that the two things that America has to offer culturally, literarily, yes. that are uniquely American, yes. going back to the 20s and 30s, are the private eye and the cowboy. Yes. 
Yes. And the authors back then who wrote the westerns, it's no surprise they also wrote the detective novels. Yes. Like Donald Hamilton even, as you go into the 40s and 50s, he wrote spy novels and westerns. <laughs> you know, so this was this sort of hero stuff, this male uh, iconic character. Yes. Was fascinating to me. Maybe because I was unsure of my own sexuality or something. I don't know. Right. But I had to find out more about what what it was like to be a guy who took charge, you know, man who, uh, yes, who sorted things out. <laughs> you know, he walks in, there's a tragedy, a family in trouble, there's a murder, there's dark skeletons in the closet, and by the end, he sorts it. He just says, okay, this is what happens. You go to jail, you're guilty, but I'm letting you skate, and I'm going to burn the house down. And he walks away with the wreckage of their secrets exposed to the sky for everyone to see. Yes. And, uh, and he can live with himself because in his own unique sort of frontier way, justice was done. Yes, yes. I love it. That's what we had, you know, mm -hmm. growing up in, in books and movies. Because I remember, you know, we talk about television, um, a TV show with uh, Stacey Keach, um, Mickey Spillane's My, My Camera. camera. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That was, I, I was actually in college for that, and, or high school, certainly. Yeah. I, I like Mickey Spillane. I like yeah. Stacy Keach. Some of those were so, <laughs> so cheesy, though. And they had this stupid thing every week where he would see the pretty girl in the face. Right. And he'd chase after her, and she's yeah. gone. I mean, come on. <laughs> but you know what? I, I would still watch them because it was, it was all there was on the TV. Right. Although, I don't know if you remember Banachek. I remember Banachek. That's yeah. a terrific show. That's a great show. Columbo, those NBC mysteries did some great stuff. Yeah, they did. They did. That was a George Papard in Banachek. Yeah. It was a. What do you think about Beretta? I used to love Beretta. That was before I was down with that New York thing. Yeah. That whole kind of savvy street, you right. know, linguistic way he had. Right. Kind of fell fell on my deaf ears a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but my dad loved it. Did he? Yeah. <laughs> and then you would just hear these stories about Robert Blake on set being a terror, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Kind of, kind of lost it for you. When, when you, when you read a novel uh, like you were talking about, and, and you draw from it, yeah. Merely a springboard, and you're drawing all other aspects from other novels that you read as you write. Because I know you said, yeah, Holiday was um, a springboard for you. <coughs> Yeah, it, what, what you do is, I think, when you read, you enjoy each particular book as you read it. Right. Looking back, you know, if I pick up a book I read five years ago, sometimes I'm hard-pressed to remember the details. I don't, I'm not photographic. I don't remember everything in the book right. from five years ago. Right. But what you do is you accumulate a database of moves yeah. and strategies yeah. that these authors took. Right. of things that were successful and things were not in either engaging you, surprising mm -hmm. you, yeah. or informing you, or right. hopefully, um, you know, moving you in a poignant way. Yeah. And so those strategies accumulate as you read more books. You see what works, and even, I think, more importantly, you see what does not work. You go, ah, that was a bad book. And the strategy in your head adjusts to avoid it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the more books you read, the more options and strategies and sort of off-handed automatic ways of working are presented to you right um, which is why I'm bewildered when I talk to a screenwriter yeah I say hey what what do you read lately that uh, you like and I say ah you know I really I, I don't have much time for reading <laughs> I, I just kind of write my screenplay I see a lot of movies <laughs> so right. you see a lot of movies <laughs> you're you're a writer it's, yeah but I'm a screenwriter right it's like oh my god you know you People who don't read books, but they write screenplays. <laughs> I, you know, don't get me started on that. You, you, that, that. It's funny that you bring that up, because I was going to head there. Because I remember uh, the, the, uh, when I had seen you at the uh, Burbank Film Festival, uh, uh, you had gone up and because you had gotten an award, and you gave this great speech, which is basically what you're saying now. And you were just saying... You should read, and you should be able to expand. And a lot of the stuff that you guys write is no good. And yeah, and well, hopefully I wasn't I, <laughs> preaching, but I think what it is, what I say to, because <coughs> I sometimes I'll talk to young kids, right? You know, and I'll I'll basically, you know, it, it's kind of a, a new thing for me is to try to, you know, just talk and give whatever I can. Yeah. Not 
pushing it, but just offering it, you know. And uh, they asked me questions, and I said, "What's the what's the deal?" Um, I said, "Well, here's the thing, kids. Uh, you're in a business, whether it's acting, producing, writing, directing, where at any given time in your trade union, SAG, DGA, yeah. whatever, ninety-three percent unemployment. Right. Ninety-three percent of the people trying to do what you're doing." can't yeah and i'm factoring in the worst writers who get work you know and still 93 percent unemployment he says that's bad news why that's crazy why would you want to do that yes. be in a field where it's 93 percent unemployment i said well here's the good news because i'll tell you something uh there's some one element that changes everything and that's talent because if you have talent Yes. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. You're no longer one of that undifferentiated sort of 93 percent tile <laughs> mass. You're not just the striver among strivers. You, you, no, you have talent. You've emerged. You've you've yes. circumvented yes. that. Move to the head of the line in essence, because you've right. the odds go south. Everything changes now yes. with talent. Yes. You've just broken uh, broken those percentiles. Here's the bad news: most of you don't have talent. <laughs> And then, yes. you know, and it, it's, it, I'm able to say that because, as you say, you look at the audience and no one's, they're all looking at each other going, yeah, that guy doesn't have talent. He's right. You know, no one ever, ever applies it to themselves, you know, yes. so <laughs> it's, it's all fine. But it's true. If you have talent, everything changes. Unfortunately, you got to have talent. Yes. Yes. That, that, that's great. Yeah. But it's, um, you know, I look at myself and I like to follow what I call the, the Sonny Bono model. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you just <laughs> I wouldn't keep, have said that. Keep at yeah, it. Yeah, keep yeah. at it. And you know, he goes from a guy who drove I think an ice cream truck to, you know, a hot group, yeah. hot variety show, all the way to co congressman senator <coughs> and from a guy who's just keep at it. Just keep at it. Yeah. And eventually you'll f you'll find your niche. I think that's that's essentially right. Um uh, there's certainly nothing to be gained by saying that no, I, I'm doing the footwork. I'm trying to live a good life. I'm planning all my strategies, and it's you know they're not working fast enough, so I'll quit. Yeah, yeah. that doesn't work. You're right. Yeah. Um, I I can track my entire career to a keystroke because I I wrote the first script I wrote. I wrote a scene, and my brother wrote it, and he he didn't like it. He said, "That's eh, a you know it's this and that, you know whatever his take was." Yeah, and so I was devastated. I, yeah. I adored him. I looked up to the guy. So. I sat at my car, typewriter and I, I thought, well, do I stop? I don't yeah. want to write now. I mean, he just told me I'm, I'm bad. Yeah. So I put the paper in the typewriter. I said, God, I don't want to do this. I, <laughs> any place but here. Yeah. Anything but this. And I held my f one finger up, a one finger typist, yeah. over the keyboard. And I just went, ah. <clears throat> and I hit the key. The wind rises, rain lashes the ground, whatever it was. Yeah. And, I and then I'm typing some dialogue. Oh, God, I hate this. What would he say here? I'll have him say this. And then the guy says, well, actually, what would he say to that? He'd say this. And then, oh, <laughs> it would be funny if actually he came back with this. Hey, that's a pretty good line. And all of a sudden, my mind recognized and he kind of went to something momentarily yeah. that was in that moment more interesting than my own fear because I just started but it was actually a, it was like a, uh, a force of will to hit the key the first key yeah. and that script became a script that I sold that then led to Lethal Weapon the next script and then my career started but it was one keystroke one finger poised above a key on a typewriter an old-fashioned typewriter yeah. and a moment of decision where I actually hit the key uh, at Mountain I guess mm -hmm. it went, and traversed it and and then hit it and and here is Shane yeah. Black. Well, well, whatever. But <laughs> I think th the key is that my dad taught me this. And I remember yes. certain things he said. He was one of the first people I heard say, don't sweat the little stuff. And then as I walk away, he goes, oh, by the way, come here. It's all little stuff. You know? <laughs> um, he also said, there's no point climbing a mountain and looking up at this huge mass ahead of you. Right. Because it looks enormous. Yes. Look in front of you and just keep taking steps. Right. You just see the rocks going by, the rocks going by, the rocks going by. And after a while, you look down and you go, holy shit, look how far I've come. Yes. So that's what it is. It's that one day at a time thing Yes. that uh, the, the good people of AA so correctly recognize. You know. Right. It's a moment by moment. And I like what you said because I had a similar, uh, similar expression where it's, um, I never did mind the little things. Right. 
<laughs> and yeah, we'll just let it go by. But you know, like I was saying, you know, when I was listening, you're reiterating the same things now about, you know, hey, talent and effort. And when I, I had uh, told someone after I heard uh, your speech, I said, you know, it, it it was brilliant because it was direct, it was insightful, and how I ended the sentence was, and. This came from Shane Black. You know, right. it's coming from someone who has traversed this this well, path. Yeah, I don't know that there's any sage wisdom or great uh, <laughs> status to be, you know, Im- implied just from. But I do know that I've been around the block, <laughs> despite what it feels like being a blink. I don't feel much younger or older than, say, 25 right now. Right. Even though I'm twice that. <laughs> but I have, looking back, been in many rooms, done this many times, yes. and uh, I don't think the industry has changed that much that the lessons I've learned aren't uh, apply, ap- applicable. And the other thing is, I think that we can fight to get back to the things that we miss. The fact that, you know, we're still in the game, the fact that David O. Russell is still making movies that would play in the 70s, yes. like The Fighter and Silver Linings Playbook and the most recent one. Um, you know, David O. Russell could be making uh, Transformers movies. He's not. Right. If you believe in the kinds of films that you feel were once somehow slightly better than what we're currently being offered, then just go and fight for that. Make that. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> I remember, I, like I had mentioned, I, I watch everything. I really love cinema. And one of my favorites were the uh, old... Um, we talked about William Smith. He did all those great 70 biker movies, mm-hmm. you know, uh, with Joe Namath and Dan Haggerty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, they were just plain and direct and, you know, simple storytelling. You have the hero and the bad guy and the love interest. And it was just but something appealing. And I think it, does, is that heading towards that rawness that uh, they used to have <coughs> or, or Billy Jack. Well, yeah. I think that they were just casually weird back then. <laughs> it didn't occur to them they were being weird. Right. Or offbeat. Yes. But it was just the natural way to do it, that you made things kind of offbeat and funky, and and it felt like uh, a swing in adventure. Yes. You know? um, <clears throat> the protagonists back then were, you know, the, the Joe Namaths, the Chris Christophersons, even Nick Nolte. We were talking earlier about North Dallas 40. And yes. You know, those are wonderful, wonderful actors and wonderful movies. And I think Billy Jack, you know, it's interesting. If you see Billy Jack again, what strikes me is that everyone hears about and goes for, goes to see it for the scenes where he goes, you know, this <laughs> beautiful girl with, the, you know, the, the <laughs> ice cream on her head or the flower or whatever. Right. And, goes, I'm, and then he basically beats the hell out of the people. Right. Um, <laughs> but they forget that the rest of Billy Jack, that's not just the fight scenes, is basically a documentary-style chronicling of a hippie commune. Yes. Where they play guitar and sing and, like, call each other flower names. and it, It's really strange, yeah. man. It's a strange movie. You know, you know, sometimes, you know, some of those movies, they have this depth to them. And I remember they had remade this maybe about 10 years ago, and I was talking to somebody. I said, they totally missed the point of the original, Rollerball. Yeah. The one with James Caan. It's a social greed. commentary. Yes. And the second one was just like, what are you guys doing? The, the second one was sci-fi TM, registered trademark, yeah. Yes. And the first one was this weird sort of postmodern, really austere, very obscure... Yes. Statement about a very austere society, and uh, it wasn't for kids. Right. And I think when they made the remake, they said, "Well, this is great, but you know, we want kids, so let's get this young guy yeah. from American Pie." Right. And let's just uh, make it more of an adventure. Look, the seventies were just weird. Zardoz was crazy. It was, <laughs> it was insane. The seventies were just influenced by a lot of drugs. <laughs> Zardoz, I love Zardoz. But you know, God bless him for that. What a what a unique crop of movies that we have at our disposal now to go back and watch. Yeah, you think about you know the Planet of the Apes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, come on. I mean, the, when Charlton Heston first speaks, yeah. 
That was great. I remember those things. Yeah, get your hands off me. Yeah. 38. Uh, <coughs> you know, the, the adventures, you know, they, they took. It seems like we go on an adventure, but it's like, why do I want to follow you? It's, it's <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. It's, it's, it's my quest every day to try to figure out when I'm writing scenes why people will care. You know, what do you do that gets them to care? What, what are the tricks of storytelling that mean that someone's engaged and they want to turn the page and see what happens yeah. versus someone who's just watching a formula story and saying, I yeah. kind of know what I'm going to see. Yeah. I ask you, um, <coughs> has your taste for movie changed uh, when you were you know, a boy up to now? Did you like the same genre? Did it just expand? Honestly, it, you know, that's what's funny. It didn't change. Even as a kid, I remember feeling gypped when things weren't adult enough. I like Johnny Quest because you had the character of Johnny in an old cartoon. Yeah. But the world of the adults that he was in was absolutely scary, real, and dangerous. Right. Then they started toning things down. Yes. Like, it wasn't superheroes anymore. They were the super friends. Yeah. <laughs> they were your friends. Right. They were helpful. They taught in between fighting some bad guy nonviolently. Yeah. They would tell you about the alphabet and, <laughs> and about how to be a socially conscious student at school and. And, and I realized these superheroes that be just became social workers yes. are not for me. Right. Um, then I had a revelation uh, it, as a boy. Yeah. Dirty Harry, the first nice. one. Oh, nice. And I thought, okay, the anti-hero. Yes. There we go. Right. No punches pulled. And so I think as a boy I was struggling to find something that wasn't this sort of watered down and when I was in the late 70s they had this thing called family viewing hour for a while they were responding to the parents councils and so from 8 to 9 you couldn't do any like on the 6 million dollar man you couldn't punch anybody you had to like throw them in a pool <laughs> you know right and as a kid I'd say oh I would just get so angry I don't just he was so cool. He used to beat the hell out of folks <laughs> used to buy an arm. throw them through windows <laughs> now they go in a tree or a pool <laughs> <laughs> but I found what I was looking for yes. in in Dirty Harry, right. which was this sort of ambiguous, bizarre, unflinching kind of adult way of approaching the topic of violence, which whether you agreed or disagreed with it, was certainly, you know, bold. Right. And boldness, even as a kid, yeah. always appealed to me. Yeah. So that's what, and that stuck. It just improved yeah. with age. Yeah. You, you know, I, same same kind of journey because I remember, you know, Steve McQueen, Bullet, mm -hmm. you know, anti-hero, The Magnificent Seven. I don't think yeah. you can get a movie that's <laughs> except for maybe the original, uh, Samurais. But look at the actors in that, and they're brilliant. To, to for, a man, yeah, you know, and uh, Eli Wallach. Mm -hmm. Oh come on, you know, it's just the presence. You know, mm. the, um, the good man, the ugly. You know, uh, yeah. Lee Van Cleef. Lee Van Cleef, and but no, the Magnificent Seven is a great model because you have Yul Brynner and Steve McQueen in the same scene as you open it. You go, holy shit, those two guys are together, and then there's more. Yeah. Then Charles Bronson shows up, you know. <laughs> then James Colburn. Colburn shows up, you know, <laughs> and yeah, it's like a banquet. And you know, you know, I love and about that movie. There are scenes that take to the heart of the character. Uh, Robert Vaughn, when he's you know talking, you know he's being vulnerable and he's talking about what he's feeling. Or uh, you mentioned Charles Bronson when he's talking to the boys. And they said we want to be like you. He goes, no, your father's the yeah, hero. Yeah. It's like wow. It's about something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what movies. I think this, the test that people today too often forget to, to apply that they don't ask themselves the question yes. is, is this about something? What's yes. this about? The moments where the hero that the kid looks up to says, no, I'm a misfit. I'm Frankenstein. Your father's not violent, but he should be your hero. Right. Not me. Yes. I'm just the guy they, I'm the Frankenstein they brought in because they can't control, you know, the violence. Right. But I'm protecting the ability of your father to be what life should be about. Yes. And those little moments where it suddenly uh, takes on these sort of echoes. Yes. Yes. These mythic Right. sort of qualities of, yes. of a lesson that's timeless and sad and poignant right we may we may look to admire the hero but look deeper and see what is there another movie um, El Dorado 
Yeah. You know, then or, or the sons of Katie Aller. You know, no, El Dorado is fantastic. Yeah. Um, because it's pulpy and poignant <laughs> at the same time. There's moments that are so realistic where the kid's shot, gut shot. And yes. He actually kills himself because he can't take the pain, and John Wayne. Yeah. Sort of walks away. With this haunted look on his face, yes. angry that the whole thing had to happen. Right. But then you have the pulpy moments where the guy yeah. takes the gun that he can't shoot. That he's been strapped <laughs> to a horse, and he's like, <laughs> he's just James Con is the, the yeah. cowboy who can't shoot straight." And he has to have the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Mississippi. Yeah, that's yeah, right. His name is Mississippi. You know, now, unfortunately, you also have Ricky Nelson singing in that. Well, yeah. <laughs> still, it's it's so. Weird. It's all. It's great. Yeah. It's like you know. Yeah. There are certain movies that you kind of uh, push aside. Because I remember um, paint your uh, paint, paint paint your, your color of the wagon. Paint your wagon. Yeah. yeah. Lee Marvin. Yeah. When uh, Clint Eastwood singing. Ah, that's right. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, good yeah, movie anyway. Yeah. Fast forward. <laughs> now we have the ability to fast forward. So. Yeah. Exactly. Because you know there, there were some of those movies. They're like uh, just brilliant acting. You know, one of the movies talking about John Wayne. I remember uh, the Cowboys. Yeah. That's great. Uh, with Bruce Dern in there, I mean, he's just, you know, he's, he's extraordinary. But John Wayne, with dealing with the boys, and, you know, he shows him this fatherly love, this manly love, and, you know, protecting them, and he's heard, and at the end, when he gives this speech, mm -hmm. it's like, wow. You know, just there are these moments. It's writing. There were guys back then that really cared about uh, the mythic quality of the writing. Yeah. Uh, they weren't trying to apply a template based right. on what seemed to be the audience, what the audience likes or what will make 800 million. They said, look, we'll make this movie, it'll be a hit. Yes. And guess what? If it's a hit, it doesn't have to be the biggest hit of all time. Yes. And if it's a hit, we don't even think we're going to make a sequel. <laughs> That's the difference. Yes. Now it's got to be the biggest hit of all time and there's got to be a sequel. Right. The one and done. You know, make it a great movie and let it stand. And yeah, just let it go. Yeah. And it's they used to do that. Yeah, yeah, they used to do that. <laughs> now, now, now they need uh, at least what four, three, four. Well, they certainly won't stop until it's you know in the ground. Or, or they'll go back to some old movie that didn't do well, and then come back and try to recast yeah. the characters. Yeah, which works occasionally. You know, I, yeah. I don't begrudge people the right. the ten poles because I just did one. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with it. <laughs> it's just when the pressure to only make the biggest hit ever right lands us in a position of tolerating 1.5 million dollar movies which have a chance to make a big profit margin or 300 million dollar epics but nothing in between i think that's a serious deficit on the landscape right and if i can just add yes you did a temple but you did it very well <coughs> you know you your direction the movie itself the writing you can tell with your movies, it, uh, definitely when I watch them, that there is a deeper connection, a deeper love for the art of filmmaking. And mm. you can see it. You, you see Iron Man 3, and it's not just, it, let's throw every, er, everything else that we haven't done up there. You can see the depth that you brought to it and everything that you do. Well, that's very nice of you to say. I think we just tried to give some thought to it. Really <laughs> make sure that we s sat down and noodled a little bit before we started blowing shit up. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, we're getting close to the end, Shane. Uh, I know you are you are going to be bringing out some new stuff and uh, looking forward to all that. Yeah. Um, well, always keeping best. busy. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Last mm -hmm. night at midnight, I wrapped a, a draft of a project, and I, that's, you know, I'm struggling to get it done before the holidays. So, <laughs> um, the next step, of course, is the studio comes back with a red pencil, and you know, <laughs> it all starts again. But, <laughs> but at least I got the holidays. Yes. You, now, now it's all. It was all set and done. And I think you were saying. Um, I turned it in. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. My buddies Anthony Bagarosi and Chuck Mondry, who were my writing partners on this thing called Doc Savage. Uh, another childhood obsession. Yes. Uh, we've we've turned in a draft. We'll see what happens. Um, if Sony's listening, then you know yeah. the in-show listeners very much want to see it. Sony. That's right. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> they do Doc Savage. That was Ron Ely back in the day. Oh, what a terrible movie! 
<laughs> Honestly, there's there's like searching for this hidden city. Yes. And they, they're on this mountaintop, but they can't find this, this hidden city. And there's one obviously placed sort of plastic bush with like three leaves. He goes, wait, what's this? And he pulls it aside and there's a path, you know. It's like, wait, 10,000 years and no one found that? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> A plastic bomb tree. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, that's great. Did, did you enjoy him as Tarzan, though? <coughs> no, Ron Ely was not a bad choice as Doc Savage. Yeah. It was just they had about a buck ninety-eight to make. <laughs> movie, so. It's and, unfortunate. And I, I know they're going to have much more from this one. I know it's going to be a Shane Black classic. Shane, thank you. You know, for taking the time, your busy schedule, the holidays, and everything. No, no, it's it's fine. Like I said, I wrapped last night. I'm just looking forward to some, some rest. Some R&R. Right. Fantastic. Thank, hey, thank you, you for having me. In. Oh, my pleasure. Really my appreciate pleasure. it. You bet. You bet. Hey, well, this is Gus Summers, and you've been listening to The In Show. And we had in-studio guest Mr. Shane Black. And I'd like to give him a great thank you for taking the time out of his busy schedule and holiday schedule for coming in. Of course, visit us at theinshow.com where you'll be able to catch up on everything we're doing. Of course, see this interview as well and look for us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube and Pinterest and all those great social media sites out there that we post all our wonderful stuff on. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, Gus has left the building.